This is my Bible. This is God speaking to me. My eyes are open. My heart is prepared to receive all of God's promises and instructions. Today I make my Bible the final authority in my life so that in every circumstance I will bear good fruit and others will see Christ in me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise. It's so good to see the youth. They, you know, be trying to battle each other with it. If you're going to battle, I'd rather you battle the Bible confession, so praise God. All right, well, this morning, uh, we're going to conclude our gathering series. And for those of you who haven't uh, been here for the series, I'm going to briefly just bring you current. The gathering series uh, was put together. God placed it on my heart for us to understand the importance of why we gather. Uh, before we go any further, does anybody need a bulletin to take notes? If so, just, just raise your hand and... Our usher will make sure you have it. Okay. Um, So in this series so far, we have talked about um, the importance of gathering as believers and the effect we have when we gather to pray. There's there's power in numbers. There's strength in numbers. We've talked about uh, what happens when we come together and how effective we are, either negatively or positively, when we're unified. And so today, we are going to conclude this series with why it's so important that we gather to hear the Word of God and fellowship with each other. So our theme scripture for this series has been Acts 2, and I'm just going to read it to you briefly. That says Acts 2.42. It says, They continually and faithfully devoted themselves to the instruction of the apostles and to fellowship. The instruction of the apostles and to fellowship, which is what we're going to talk about today, to eating meals together and to pray. And like Sister Merlinda said, we love to eat. (laughs) So we're going to take that scripture literally. (laughs) So anyways, the instruction that came from the apostles was the gospel. And the gospel is the message of Jesus Christ, as we have talked about in our faith series. Now, if you think about that, if someone was so devoted to faithfully come and hear instruction, that must have meant there was a value to the instruction if they faithfully devoted themselves to come. How many of you who work faithfully go to work every day? There's a value to you going to work faithfully, right? If you don't go to work, what happens? You don't get paid. And if you don't get paid, what happens? Can't pay your bills. Okay. So there was a value placed on why they went daily. So what we want to look at is what's the value that's placed on this instruction? So if you will, turn with me to 2 Timothy. And while you're turning there, I want to tell you something about the book of Timothy. Paul had an apprentice known as Timothy. And Timothy was not what someone would have thought would have been a leader but Paul saw something in him and the book of Timothy could pretty much be um, a manual for leaders because what Paul did in the book of Timothy was not only give Timothy instructions and qualifications for being a leader but he was giving instructions on how to lead and when, when I was studying about the relationship between Paul and Timothy what I liked is that Paul reminded Timothy just because I'm here to mentor you, you already had someone who has done that, your mother, your grandmother. And all I'm doing is pulling out a gift that I see. And I'm trying to mold you to see how this is supposed to be. And it kind of reminded me, I can't ever study without thinking about Pastor Lori. And today's precious because my mom is here. And and many of you know Pastor Lori was like a, a spiritual mother to me. But Pastor Lori never discounted my relationship with my mom. Pastor Lori always said, your mom gave you something that I can't give you. She gave you this. She raised you in this foundation. All Pastor Lori did was identify my gift. Now, what's interesting is my mom went to the school of ministry, as I shared with all of you before, at Crenshaw Christian Center. And I used to go with my mom at night when she would go to school and sit in the cafeteria and do my homework. Remember that, Mom? I used to ride with her and sit in the cafeteria. We used to listen to Debbie Boone on the way. And... Um, I never thought that I would be pastoring, (laughs) that my mom was going to the school of ministry. I didn't have no part of that. I was just supporting my mom. 
But Pastor Lori saw a gift, but it wasn't that she instilled the gift. It was already there. So what Paul was doing here with Timothy is, he's just telling you, this is what you need to do. So what I'm telling you today, you already know this. I'm just going to help you pull it out. So 2 Timothy 4, verse 1, it says, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, of Christ Jesus, who is the judge, the living and the dead. And we've talked about this before, about if you really believe. I would hate to be judged once I'm dead, if I didn't make the right decision. Who is the judge, the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Remember, he's talking to Timothy, and he's telling Timothy, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn their ears away from the truth and will turn aside to myths but you be sober in all things endure hardships do the work of the evangelist fulfill your ministry for I am already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure has come I have fought the good fight I have finished the course I have kept the faith Paul definitely endured during his time of ministry but what he's saying here is you preach the word no matter how it's received no matter if you leave here and don't do it no matter if it tickles your ears we are to preach the word not dilute it not taint it not make it pleasing and whatever we have to endure because of that you are to teach the word which means the instruction that you come to hear is the word. Amen. Nothing less, nothing more to teach the word. However, coming to hear the word is just one part. There is a part that you play as a participant. I'm going to skip it. Is that okay? Thank you. Appreciate it. Because then you guys will watch me trying to put it on. That's not cute. There's a part that you play when you come to hear the word. The messenger delivering God's word is just one part. But you coming to hear it, there's something that is required of you besides you just sitting here to hear the word. So let's take a look at 1 Thessalonians 5. 1 Thessalonians 5, we're going to read verse 9. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep there we go again whether you're living or dead we will live together with him those who are with Christ will live together with him therefore encourage one another and build one another just as you are doing but we request of you brethren that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction and that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work, their work of giving you instruction. Live in peace with one another. We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone, even those who don't get it just yet. Be patient with everyone. See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for another and for all people. Interesting that this scripture is telling us to appreciate those who give instruction, but at the same time come to hear instruction and encourage one another. So we talk about you're coming to be a blessing, not just to get. You're coming not just to hear the word. You're coming to be a blessing one to another when we come to hear the word. But it's also telling you to get to know those who are laboring among you. So let me read verse 12 in the Amplified Version. It says, Now also we beseech you, brethren, get to know those who labor among you. Recognize them for what they are, 
Acknowledge and appreciate and respect all of them, your leaders who are over you in the Lord. If you are coming to receive instruction and you don't know the heart of your pastor, you just might get offended when you hear something that doesn't tickle your ear. It's important to get to know not just your pastor, but your leaders, the usher team. Let's say, for instance, that we teach a message on tithing. You don't necessarily agree with tithing. And you say, they just want our money. Well, clearly, you haven't gotten to know our heart or have been here because if you have been here and got to know us and know our heart, you would know that in our connection class, we share with those who decide to make the river their home, that we as pastors do not receive a salary for pastoring. So whether you give or not doesn't affect you. We've preached it from the pulpit. We have shared that every month our board of elders knows where the money is being spent that comes in. And every year we tell the congregation where the money has been spent. So if you're offended by an offering message, it isn't because you don't like the word. You're offended because you don't know us and don't know our heart. If, if Elder Reggie, who is also over our ushers department, tells you, can you do me a favor and squeeze in? Well, if you don't know him, you may think, well, he didn't tell that person to squeeze in. Why did he tell me to squeeze in? Well, Elder Reggie serves as our usher, our department head usher. Elder Reggie is trying to do things decently in order. His job is to make sure we are all safe. If he needs to keep a good eye on us and needs all of us to come closer, then we need to be obedient because we know Reggie's heart. But if you come late and leave early and don't come to participate in getting to know those who labor among you, then you'll never get to know our hearts and will constantly be offended if you hear something that doesn't tickle your ear. Amen. So we gather for instruction. We are coming to hear the proclamation of God's word. And as fallen human beings, unfortunately, we need weekly reminders to stop the rationalizing, the questioning, the philosophizing of everything we hear 24-7. We're, we're rationalizing people's behavior instead of pausing to think about what does God say about this but we're constantly philosophizing. I, I hate seeing all these philosophers on Facebook always got something philosophical to say about what's happening we need as fallen human beings an opportunity to come together to pause and hear the instruction hear God's word so turn with me to Galatians 6. Remember, we're still talking about what is your participant, your participation when you come to hear the word. You remember the story of Mary and Martha? Well, Mary knew when to pause and just sit at the feet of Jesus. We have to learn how to just pause and when it's time to sit. So let's take a look at Galatians 6. Galatians 6. We're going to read verse 6. I'm going to read this from the Amplified Version. It says, let him who receives the instructions in the word of God share all good things with his teacher, contributing to his support. This, hear me clearly, this is not a money message. There's a point here that I want you to understand, so listen to me good. During this time of history, the teachers charged a fee for instruction. And a lot of philosophers insisted on having um, common grounds between teachers and disciples. So, for instance, Jesus and the disciples, they shared a lot of common goods. You follow me? They shared a lot of common goods. Well, during this time, some teachers charged for their instruction. But what Paul was telling the church, the Galatian church here, was it's not about the money. It's the value on the instruction. If you are receiving sound doctrine, you should be supporting the place where you're receiving sound doctrine. It isn't about the money. It's about the value of the instruction. Now, you can go anywhere 
and get instruction. But is it sound doctrine? And that's what Paul is saying here, that you should be supporting the place of where you receive sound doctrine. Now, we've already seen the danger for gathering for unrighteous causes. Remember at the beginning of the series, we talked about how they were, just a few people were able to take prayer out of schools because a few people gathered and they were effective. So what Paul is saying here is there is a value to the sound doctrine because if we gather for sound doctrine, it helps us to be more effective. It helps us to be more effective. Now, when Paul was speaking to the church, the whole book of Galatians, Paul's main purpose was to bring an erring group of people back to God's purpose and plan. So let's look at Galatians 5.25. We're still talking about your participation. So what we know so far is you're supposed to participate by coming to hear doctrine, getting to know those who labor among you, fellowship with those who are, are here at the church with you, and put a value on your sound doctrine. There's something else required of us when we come to hear the word. Galatians 5.25. It says, if we live by the Holy Spirit, let us also walk by the Holy Spirit. If by the Holy Spirit we have our life in God, let us go forward walking in line, our conduct controlled by the Spirit. So if you're not learning how to live by the Spirit, then how do you live by the Spirit? If you're not learning how to live by the Spirit, then how do you live by the Spirit? Where do you learn to live by the Spirit? In the Word. So you're going to either study it at home, but you have a responsibility to gather to hear sound instruction. What's our sole purpose for gathering? We talked about this in the first part of the series. To spur one another on to love, right? So if we are doing these things, if we are coming to spur one another on to love, but we're not understanding sound doctrine, prioritizing sound doctrine, when we get together, what well or resources are you pulling from to spur each other on? Your life experience or God's word? Your life experience is only going to get you so far. So your life experience may be facts, but God's word is the truth. So for us to live by the Spirit, have our conduct controlled by the Spirit, we are going to have to come hear sound, in, uh, sound doctrine. But let's skip down to Galatians 6.1. Because when we get together and we fellowship, something might happen. Galatians 6.1 says, Brethren, if any person is overtaken in misconduct, or sin of any sort, you who are spiritual, who are responsive to and controlled by the Spirit, should set him right and restore him and reinstate him without any sense of superiority and with all gentleness, keeping an attentive eye on yourself, lest you should be tempted also. You cannot do Galatians 6 1 without doing Galatians 5 25. Okay, so follow me. If you are not coming to receive sound doctrine, going home and studying sound doctrine, when we get together in fellowship and all of a sudden somebody says something like, you know, I was kicking it last night at the club and I went home with somebody who's not my husband. Okay, so if I'm not listening to sound doctrine, I might be hearing somebody say that and be like, oh, girl, for real, how was it? Okay, so if we're supposed to come to church to fellowship, aren't we going to find these things out? So what this is saying is when we come and fellowship and get to know each other and you happen to tell me something crazy, it's my responsibility to set you straight. Otherwise, what are we gathering for? Then we're gathering uselessly. We're supposed to gather to spur each other to love. So if you telling me you did something crazy, I'm going to say, girl, I'm sure that was fun. But you know you was wrong, right? You know you had no business doing that. Now, if you haven't got to know me, you just might get offended by that. 
But if you know me, and some people have, where I've had to pull you aside and say, sweetie, I really don't think you should be wearing that. But they receive it because they love me, and they know I love them. But that's what's required of us when we gather to hear sound instruction. If we're hearing sound instruction, I get to know you, and you say something crazy, it is not for you to come say, Pastor, this person did this. That's not, they were fellowshipping with you. You need to tell them. Did you just hear the service this morning? We was not supposed to do that. Next time, call me. I'll come be your club buddy. Okay? There's nothing wrong with going to a club. Y'all want to go to a club, go to a club. Set the example while you're at the club. The Bible is very clear in showing us that we need to have a vertical and horizontal relationship. We need a vertical relationship with God. We have to love God, get to know God, walk in the righteousness of God. And when we do that, we learn to love people. We have fellowship with each other. So we're vertically with God, horizontal with each other. Love God, love people. When we gather for instruction, we're all hearing the same instruction. But we've got to have patience because some of us get it, some of us don't. Right? But when we fellowship and you kind of off, then I just got to pull you aside and be like, girl, we got we to gotta tighten this up. So I think I've given this example before. You might be smoking every day, but you say, hey, and we smoke twice this week. That's progress. Yes. We're not looking for perfection. Right. We're looking for progress in our walk. Because when we gather, we are spurring each other on to love. You can't spur someone on to love if you're beating them over the head about what they're doing wrong. Amen? Amen? Amen. All right, so let's turn to Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3. Now, when we all do this collectively, there is something that will happen in us as a church if we do this collectively. It can't be the pastor. It can't be one person. We gather collectively, and this is what happens when we do that. Ephesians 3.8. It says, to me, the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery which for ages have been hidden in God who created all things so that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the, through who? The church. The church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord. God's plan is to work through the church to influence the world. Work through the church. In a minute, I'm going to clarify. I don't mean in the church. But through the church, John 3, 16 says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We have to quit separating ourselves from the world and love the world as much as God so loved it so that we can influence the world. But we're so high and mighty about I can't associate with non-believers. We have no influence. We have no influence. A few weeks ago, remember I read uh, John 17, 20, where Jesus didn't pray to take us out of the world. He prayed for God to protect us so that we could be united and make an influence on the world. So through the church, we would help manifest God's eternal purpose for this world. But that starts with us. That starts with us. So then you say, well then, does that mean that all of our fellowship and everything that we need to do to influence the world starts and stops at church. Turn to Acts 2, but I want you to look at verse 46. Because what we're concluding in this series is our fellowship, and our fellowship outside of these walls is just as or more important than what happens inside of these walls. <laughs> Acts 2, 46, I'm going to read this in the Amplified. It says, and day after day, they regularly assembled in the temple with united purpose. They sometimes got problems coming to church once a week. They gathered every day. 
with united purpose. And, say and. and. In their what? Homes. Where? Homes. Mm-hmm. In their homes. They broke bread, meaning food, including the Lord's Supper. They partook of their food with gladness and simplicity and generous hearts constantly praising God and being in favor and goodwill with all people. Say all. All. And the Lord kept adding to their number daily those who were being saved from spiritual death, which means he can't add to your number saved people who are already saved. The people he added to their number daily who were being saved from spiritual death were sinners, which means they were in fellowship with sinners in their homes, having food, kicking it, fellowshipping. How far are you going to get if you're only fellowshipping with each other? We already saved. Your fellowship has got to include some sinners. Now, don't make that excuse to be sinning with them. Okay? You want to go to the club, you smoking and drinking, oh, I'm just, you know, kicking it with the sinners. No. They're influencing you. You can be at the club and have some water, some soda. Nothing wrong with having a drink. The Bible says not to be taken with with wine, not to be drunk. That's a message for later. But we'll talk about that, young people. (laughs) I see that through my peripheral, my peripheral. Now, this sounds good for the early church. It sounds good, but that's not easy, right? Well, praise God for what? Instruction. Because there is instruction on how we're supposed to fellowship. Would you like to know? Yes. All right. So turn to Galatians 6. Galatians 6 is, Galatians is the bomb book. You might want to study that out. Galatians 6, 10. This, this part of the message, looking at the clock, is where some people might get a little uncomfortable. Galatians 6, 10. So then, as occasion and opportunity open up to us. Let us do good morally to who? All people. All people. Not only being useful or profitable to them, but also doing what is for their spiritual good and advantage. Be mindful to be a blessing, especially to those of the household of faith, those who belong to God's family with you, the believers. Okay, let's go back up where it says, let us do good to all being useful or profitable to them, but also doing what is for their spiritual good and advantage. Okay, so if a non-believer is in my presence, I have no room to try to be spiritually good to them if I have not developed a relationship. Because otherwise, I would just appear to be somebody knocking on the door and trying to throw religion down their throat. See, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So that means in order for someone to know how much you care, you're going to have to spend some time with some sinners so that they see your heart and know that you care. You love them. So when the opportunity arises for you to be spiritually good, it will be received. But that can't be received if we're not spending time with them see that? Now, the scripture says, let me clarify, it says, be mindful to be a blessing, especially to those of the household of faith. It says, especially to, not just. So although the emphasis is, especially to the household of faith, it's not saying only to save people. Now, sometimes what I love about this particular passage is sometimes as believers, we look to see who we could be a blessing to that has a need, and we miss the people in our presence who have a need. That's what I love about the scripture is just because we're believers and we're all here getting the word, if you're paying attention and you're in fellowship with each other, you will discover your neighbor next to you has a need. You don't have to go looking downtown to find somebody with a need. I'm going to go give to the poor. you got the poor sitting right next to you. And it may not necessarily be finances. It may be somebody's going through a hard time and just needs to know that you love them, you care, and you want them to come over for coffee. 
Remember, they met with simplicity. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. Let's take a look at Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13. And when we gather, it puts us in position to discover each other's needs. <laughs> Hebrews 13, 2. It says, Do not forget or neglect or refuse to extend hospitality to strangers. In the brotherhood, being friendly, cordial, gracious, Sharing the comforts of your what? The comforts of your... How many of you have been somewhere and you're like, I just want to get home? Have you been somewhere and you're like, I just want to go home. I just want to get home. We're supposed to share the comfort of our home and doing your part generously. For through it, some have entertained angels without knowing it. Now, within the context of this scripture, it's important to know that the culture then, hospitality hospitality normally involved um, taking care of travelers and the most um, uh, greatest virtue in Jewish texts is the story of Abraham in Genesis 18 where he was being hospitable to three travelers in which two of them ended up being angels that's the contents of the scripture to help you get a better understanding I'm so glad that Jesus is our example because he clarifies this in Matthew 25 Remember, Jesus is always our example, but we're not supposed to neglect hospitality. And in just in case you don't know what hospitality is, Matthew 25. I know people, you know, their home is their home. They don't want nobody in their home. I don't like people. I don't like women. I don't like chit-chat. Matthew 25. <laughs> I don't need to make friends. I have friends. Matthew 25. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed to my father, inherit the kingdom, prepare for you, for the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord... When did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and came to you? The king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you do it to me. When we open our doors, open our homes... Open our wallet, feed, clothe someone with a need. You are doing that to Jesus Christ. You are doing it to him. We did a, a brunch for virtuous women at out my home, and we had uh, received a message from someone that they were bringing somebody who was homeless. Praise God that one of our women identified somebody homeless and said, I'm going to bring you to this women's brunch. Now, what I saw in that was, this may be the only meal she gets today, so we're going to open our doors. But honestly, there were a few people that were like, well, do we want to do that? Do we want them to know where you live? Um, what should we do? We're going to welcome her in and love on her. And you know what? It turned out, she ended up um, winning a gift, which was some women's body wash and things perfect for somebody who may not necessarily have a place, maybe going in and out to bathrooms to clean up, but now they have something nice and fed. We have to be willing to open ourselves up to whoever comes along our path. We never know we may be entertaining angels and quit using all the excuses for why we don't entertain. Be hospitable. 1 Peter 4, 9 says, Be hospitable one to another without complaint. Without complaint. We should find it a joy and grab the opportunities and occasions to be hospitable to anyone. This means we quit saying, I don't like women. Most women don't like women. We'll have to do a teaching on that. It's too much riffraff. 
It's too much riffraff. The Bible talks about it. It's better to sit on a rooftop than hear a nagging wife. We just, we talk too much. That's why we don't like hanging out with women. But we have to hang around with women. How are we going to help some of those women quit being nagging wives if we don't hang around them? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We got to help bring them up. We have to bring them up. See, we have to see the value. Do it with simplicity. You don't have to go all out and make a 10-course meal. Have a cup of coffee. Have some water. Crackers. Break out with communion. Cracker and a juice. It says they partook in meals and the Lord's Supper. Keep it simple. Now, remember, the Lord added to their number in the early church, right? When they did good to all people. Let's look at Romans 12. Romans 12. Romans 12, 13 says, Contribute to the needs of God's people, sharing in the necessities of the saints. Pursue the practice of hospitality. You can't contribute to the necessities of the saints if you don't know what they are. So when you decide to seclude yourself because you're going through something and then you're upset because nobody helped you, well, we don't know unless you're in fellowship and you tell somebody. So fellowship is a two-way street. You got to be here to tell somebody and somebody else needs to be here to listen. But we can't share in the necessities of each other if we're not fellowshipping, united, gathering, pursuing hospitality, pursuing fellowship with one another inside and outside of the church. Too many people get offended. I was sick and nobody called me. Nobody knew you were sick. Or we get here and we're so caught up in ourselves that we don't know the person next to us was sick. We are to gather to spur each other on to love. And when you spur someone on to love, you get out of yourself can't spur someone on to love if you only think about you. It's not about you. Verse 14, it says, you know, and when you pursue the hospitality, pursue hospitality, don't be the Grinch. Just be hospitable. Practice. I'm going to let you use me to practice. Y'all invite me over. I'll come be your practice. Don't make me no chicken on a bone. I don't like that. But I like coffee. But it can't be strong coffee because it gives me the jitters. Okay, verse 14, it says, Bless those who persecute you. You who are cruel, who are cruel in their attitude towards you. Bless those who are cruel in your attitude towards you. Bless and do not curse them. I'm so glad God doesn't treat us the way we treat people. Because, y'all know, somebody give us attitude, we quick to cut them off. Mm. That's how you're going to do me? Oh, you ain't getting nothing. We all do it. I'm so glad God doesn't do that because we give him all kind of attitude. I'm so glad he doesn't say, well, I'm not going to listen to Norca's prayer today. She gave me attitude. Praise God he doesn't do that because how many of you have been so wrong with God? You know you ain't been living right. Then you're in a situation, you calling on God, and you're not even thinking about uh just five minutes ago, I was cursing at God. You call on him because you need him. Thank goodness he doesn't treat us like we treat each other. You know, it says to bless them. How do you bless them? Well, I'll give you an example. We were in the hospital. Now, I'm not talking about my mother-in-law. We have preached this. We have said this. And she actually bore witness here in the congregation when I said we didn't have the best relationship. And if you guys that were here remember, she yelled out, no, we didn't. <laughs> so I'm not telling you nothing she don't know. We did not have the best relationship. And when Andre's sister passed grief, when she was in the hospital before she passed, um, we already didn't have a great relationship. When she was in the hospital and your daughter is going through something that's terminal, she wasn't very kind. Okay? And she was very mean towards me because she already didn't like me. Now, I got an attitude with the attitude and left. Because I was like, really? I'm out. Right, babe? I left. 
And my whole way home, the Lord was messing with me. You need to bless those who have an attitude toward But Lord, that was so wrong. I don't deserve that. I was just trying to help. So the next day I went to the hospital, and because she was spending day in and day out at the hospital, I bought her a pair of tennis shoes. And I came in, and I just said, good morning, Paula. I thought you could use these. She was chill the rest of the day. Now, it didn't take this long, drawn-out conversation about, I know you're under pressure, but you shouldn't be going off on me. I'm here to help you. It didn't take all that. Bless those who have attitude towards you. Amen. Someone got attitude towards you, you better figure out how you're going to bless them. How are you going to bless them? When Andre act up, I make his lunch. <laughs> I make it all extra good, put something good in there. So he go to work like, dang. And he says it all the time, babe, why you got to be so consistent? Bless them. Find a way. You know how to bless the people that got to give you an attitude. You know what turns you off. You know what would bless them. So in the mix of them, mess with you, bless them. Let's pick it up, verse 15, 12, 15. It says, rejoice with those who rejoice, sharing others' joy. Reap with those who weep, sharing in their grief. Again, spurring each other on to love. If we come together and somebody's rejoicing, over a testimony or something happened in their life, we should be rejoicing with them. If they come in here down, they uh, uh, experience loss, we should be having grief with them, holding them up. Verse 16, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, snobbish, high-minded, and exclusive, but readily adjust yourself to people, things, and give yourself to humble tasks. Never overestimate yourself or be wise in your own conceit. As Christians, we are snobby and high-minded and exclusive. We don't want to kick it with unbelievers. I only associate myself with, with believers. I don't have time for those heathens. You know, we're having lunch with my prayer circle. That's snobby and high-minded. We're exclusive. How does anybody, remember in the book of Acts, people were added daily, meaning they fellowshiped so good, the sinners wanted to hang out with them. It wasn't the Christians looking at the sinners going, they having fun and we not. The sinners were like, I want to hang with them. And the Christians were like, come on, hang with us. And then converted them. Why are we not converting the world? Because we're snobby and high-minded and exclusive. It says not everything is going to be your way. So readily adjust yourself. Somebody comes in your circle who isn't a believer, adjust yourself to people and things, which means if you were talking all holy, you may need to stop because that's going to be a turn off. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you the words. If we're living by the Spirit, our conduct is in line with the Spirit, and we readily adjust ourselves to all things and people. So when things don't go our way, we adjust. We adjust. Now, if you do this joyfully, willingly, Proverbs 27, 17 happens. This is iron sharpens iron. So as a man sharpens the countenance of his friends to show rage of worthy praise. See, we don't gather uselessly. We gather with a purpose. A knife might be dull, but it's still a knife. When it's dull, it loses its effectiveness, but it's still a knife, right? So you as a believer, for you to be effective with non-believers, you must sharpen yourself with believers. So it's not we're so fellowship with unbelievers that we forget the believers. You can't be effective with unbelievers if you are not fellowshipping with believers. Are you following me? The key to sharpening yourself is sharpening yourself with believers. Now, I'm going to bring this whole series full circle, okay? The beginning of the series, we recognize the importance of gathering. We identified we are effective for prayer when we gather. There's strength in numbers. How our worship brings a fragrance to the Lord. Remember, it's our worship that creates the fragrance. Not one worship, but our worship creates a fragrance. 
We gather for sound doctrine that puts us in a position to have fellowship with each other, get to know those who are laboring with each other so that we can carry each other's burdens. But if we discover our brother or sister is living in a compromising situation because we have gathered for sound doctrine, it puts us in relationship to hold them accountable. And when we hold them accountable, the ripple effect is that we leave the church and can now effectively affect the world, the non-believers, because we gather together to get all that we need, holding each other accountable, ironing, sharpening iron so that we can leave and be effective. Amen? For the church to fulfill God's will for his eternal purpose, we have to gather as one body. But gathering starts with you. You have to make the decision that you will be present. Remember, the heart of our prayer and our praise is only a reflection of those who participate. The heart of our prayer and our praise is only a reflection of those who participate. Now, I've asked you this question a couple weeks, and I'm going to close with this. Will you be present? Will you be present to gather for prayer? Will you be present to gather for praise, to create a fragrance before the Lord? Will you be present to hear sound instruction? Will you be present to get to know your pastor and the leaders and those who labor among you? Will you be present to fellowship with one another, to carry each other burden, to reap Weep with those who weep. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Will you be present to hold your brother or sister accountable next to you when they share with you something in their life that is contrary to the sound doctrine you came to hear? Will you be present to go out and affect the world? Will you be present for fellowship with non-believers? Will you be present? Let's pray.